the autumn of 1888, a series of brutal murders in the East End of London lit a flame that sent shockwaves reverberating around the civilized world and caused a scandal that struck right at the heart of the British establishment. London, in 1888, was the world's largest capital city. Queen Victoria sat upon the throne of England and ruled an empire that was ever expanding. She had recently celebrated 50 glorious years as monarch. Her subject seemed confident, entrepreneurial and determined. The city of London, the financial boiler room that powered the empire and its expansion, reflected the supreme confidence of the age. Yet right on its doorstep lay the district of Whitechapel, a sordid, crime-ridden quarter where vice, violence and drunkenness flourished and where 76,000 residents lived in abject poverty. The East End really was outcast London. Um, in 1883, when the chairman uh, for the London School Boards did a report, he reported that out of, sort of 1,129 families, 871 of them were living in rooms, just one room big, and up to nine people per room. Whitechapel had the capital's worst slums, worst overcrowding and highest death rates. It was also the immigrant district, and the 1880s had seen a huge influx of Jewish refugees fleeing persecution in Russia, Poland and Romania. Parts of Whitechapel had the appearance of a foreign town, whose inhabitants, mostly lower-class Jews, spoke their own language and dressed differently to the other citizens of the East End. There was a very large Jewish community in the East End. Uh, there had been um, a large, a huge immigration into the East End at, uh, in the in 1880s. The immigrants were, were living in a way that was different to the, to the Gentile population, and a lot of the Gentile population resented that. Not so much resented the fact that these people were Jewish, although there, there was anti-Semitism. Inevitably, this led to a certain amount of racial tension as these immigrants were accused of taking English jobs and English homes. But whether they were Jew or Gentile, all those who lived in the area shared one thing in common. Life was a daily battle for survival. The area was terribly overcrowded. People lived crammed together in miserable circumstances, in absolutely dire poverty all arches damp and dripping and there was sort of um, straw on the floor and lots of horse dropping and all horses everywhere. The area was very, very grim, very poverty stricken, there's no sanitation, there's just off the main highways and byways you've got loads of alleyways and courts with people just throwing out their sewage and their rubbish. I mean the stench must have been awful in the East End. For the poor and destitute, the main accommodation was offered by the common lodging houses. There were 233 of them in Whitechapel, and each night 8,500 men, women and children sought shelter within their decaying walls. Now, if you were in a common lodging house, because of course nobody could afford their own sort of flat or house, it would cost you 8 pence for a double bed, um, 4 pence for a single one, and if you couldn't afford that, for tuppence, you could go to sleep standing up, lined up against a rope, stretched from one side of the room to the other, and hundreds of men, women and children did that every night in Whitechapel. For the women, there were few career opportunities, and those that were available paid a pittance, barely enough to cover the cost of a bed in a common lodging house, and certainly not enough to pay for food as well. So many of them turned to prostitution, not out of any real choice, but out of a necessity to survive. The Met actually sort of estimated that there were over 1,200 prostitutes of a very low class actually working in Whitechapel. On the surface, Victorian London may have seemed supremely confident and eminently respectable, but beneath that surface there lurked a general feeling of extreme unease. In the 1880s you had all the, these, these different fears and anxieties and this kind of social fear really of, of things that were going on, the changes to the ordered society that the middle classes and the upper classes were, were so used to. 
And it was a, a period where a lot of people were frightened. There was a, there was a genuine fear of, that there was going to be a revolution. The East End came to be the focus for all of that anxiety, all of that social anxiety. Jack the Ripper came along at just the right time, in just the right place, and he frightened people in the same way as all these other fears were frightening people. And so Jack the Ripper, in many ways, became the embodiment, the physical embodiment of all of those anxieties. If the Ripper could step across the border from the poverty-stricken, immoral East End and infect the rest of London, then so could all of these other kind of nebulous fears spill across and make, bring about uh, an awful lot of, of social unrest and social change. But the fact is that, that it did penetrate the consciousness of the people in a way that an ordinary murderer hadn't done in the, in the past and would never do again. At around 3.40 a.m. on August 31st, 1888, a carter named Charles Cross was walking along Bucks Row here in Whitechapel when, in a gateway that used to stand here, he saw what he took to be a bundle lying on the ground. Thinking it was a tarpaulin that might prove useful, he went over to inspect it, but stopped in his tracks when he saw it was a woman lying there. Moments later, he heard footsteps behind him and turning, saw another carter, Robert Paul, approaching. Nervously, the two men approached the silent form and stooped down over the body. Charles Cross felt the woman's hands. They were quite cold. Robert Paul, meanwhile, was leaning over, trying to see if he could detect any sign of breath. He couldn't. But when he touched the chest, he fancied it moved slightly. I think she's breathing, he told his companion, but very little if she is. Paul wanted to sit the woman up, but Charles Cross didn't want to touch the body any further. So they thought they'd wasted enough time at the scene, so they pulled her skirts down to cover her decency and went on their way, agreeing to tell the first policeman they met of their find. But what neither man had noticed in the darkness was that the woman's throat had been cut so savagely that her head had almost been severed from her body. That discovery was made by PC John Neal as he walked his beat along Bucks Row shortly after Cross and Paul had left the scene. It was he who raised the alarm and sent for local medic Dr. Cluellen, who having carried out a cursory examination of the body, gave orders for its removal to the mortuary. Here, the night held a further shock, for when Inspector Sprattling arrived to take down a description of the deceased, he discovered something that had so far eluded everyone. Beneath her bloodstained clothing, a deep gash ran along her abdomen. She had been disemboweled. Jack the Ripper's reign of terror had begun. The woman's name was Mary, or Polly, Ann Nichols, a 43-year-old prostitute who had earlier been ejected from a nearby lodging house because she didn't have the fourpence to pay for a bed. I'll soon get my DOS money, she had confidently predicted. See what a jolly bonnet I've got. That bonnet now lay trampled in a white chapel gutter. Polly had her throat cut from left to right, right back to the spinal column. Um, she had several incisions on her body. She was ripped up to the breastbone, but no organs were removed that we know of from Polly. Since the murder had taken place on the eastern fringe of Whitechapel, responsibility for its investigation fell to the officers of the Metropolitan Police's J Division. However, there had already been two previous murders that year in the very heart of Whitechapel, and they were being investigated by detectives of H Division, headed by Inspector Edmund Reed. Officially, there were only five Jack the Ripper victims, although there were two other murders that happened before that of Polly Nichols, which most history books considered the first Jack the Ripper murder. Um, the murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith in April 1888 and that of Martha Tabram or Turner in August 1888 are considered by some people to have been the early sort of works of Jack the Ripper. The early crimes, the pre-canonical five murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tabram are sometimes included in with the, with the Ripper murders and, and sometimes they're excluded. Emma Elizabeth Smith almost certainly wasn't. She appears to have been the victim of a, of a street gang and uh, why she was, she was murdered 
um, or, or violated so badly that she died from, from the injuries uh, isn't known, but she, was, uh, she, she is unlikely to have been a Ripper victim. Whether or not the murders of Smith, Tabram and Nichols were the work of the same hand, three such gruesome killings in such close proximity, coupled with the local disquiet that the crimes were causing, led to the involvement of officers from the Metropolitan Police's headquarters at Scotland Yard. Their commissioner was Sir Charles Warren, an ex-military man who in the coming weeks would find his competence questioned in the newspapers on an almost daily basis. I don't think Sir Charles Warren was in the least bit incompetent. Uh, he was, and, and it has to be said that when he was appointed to be commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, uh, that the press at the time didn't think he was the wrong man for the job either. It was only as a result of his over-violent reaction to the Trafalgar Square riots in 1887 that the press, the radical press in particular, turned against him. On the very day of the Polly Nichols murder, Dr Robert Anderson had been appointed the new Assistant Commissioner and Head of Scotland Yard's Criminal Investigation Department, or CID. Dr Robert Anderson, as he was at the time of the crimes, was the head of the CID. He was the Assistant Commissioner of Scotland Yard and uh, was the man who would have had um, overall charge of, of how the, the, the Ripper crime was investigated. Unfortunately, Robert Anderson came to his post suffering from exhaustion and his doctor ordered that he take an immediate holiday. So no sooner had he taken up office than he left London for Switzerland and in his absence, overall responsibility for the investigation fell to Chief Inspector Donald Sutherland Swanson. As the detective with overall responsibility for the police investigation and for reading and assessing virtually every piece of evidence and information to do with the murders, Swanson would acquire an almost unrivaled knowledge of the case. With three murders now stirring up genuine panic in the neighbourhood, Scotland Yard sent in one of its finest detectives, Inspector Frederick George Aberline, a man who knew the East End of London and its underworld intimately. He would become one of the most important of the on-the-ground detectives. Inspector Aberline was uh, a very respected policeman of the day. He was the, uh, a man with a, with a brilliant career in the East End of London who, just before the Ripper murders took place, had been uh, promoted to Scotland Yard. And when the Ripper murders uh, were happening, he was transferred or moved back across to the East End uh, to oversee the investigation on the ground in that area because he knew it so well. problems facing the police was that the district where the murders occurred was one of the most crime-ridden and densely populated quarters of the Victorian metropolis. Often referred to as darkest London or outcast London, it was a slum-ridden warren of overcrowded dwelling houses where vice and violence flourished. But it, yes, it was a very rough area, um, street crime, petty thievery. I mean, there were several streets known as the blackest of the black streets, um, including Thrall Street, where Polly Nichols was living at the time. And policemen wouldn't go down those streets unless they were in groups of four. That's how rough these little streets were for street robbery. It was very noisy, uh, very wet always, and very cobbled, what, that's what I remember. There was one way, however, that many of the local populace chose to blot out the hardships of their daily lives, and that was to drink themselves into a stupor. Drunkenness was very common in Whitechapel and the whole of the East End, really. People, it was a vicious circle. As soon as they had some money through work, they would go to the pub to drink their sorrows away, basically. So you would have your family, and if you're a gentleman, you'd give, you'd give your wife some money, and then she'd probably not spend it on food for the children, but also spend it on gin, because gin was so cheap at that time. Violence was very common, because with all the drink available 24 hours a day, you can imagine, 
people by the early hours of the morning might be very drunk indeed. There were plenty of fights and outbreaks of violence. But despite the frequent violence, actual murder was quite uncommon, and the killings began to stir up genuine revulsion in the area. Murder was actually quite uncommon at the time. Apparently the year before there'd only been half a dozen murders the whole year. So obviously to have such a high level of crime, so many murders in literally a few weeks, it really did cause a huge widespread panic throughout not just the East End but the West End too. I mean, women would not go out um, after dark in the West End and those who were forced to go out in the East End, we've actually got reports of them actually carrying guns and knives to protect themselves. On the streets of Whitechapel, Reed and Abilene were in a desperate race against time to catch the killer before he struck again. And then their inquiries amongst the local prostitutes turned up a likely suspect in the form of a man whom the local streetwalkers knew simply as Leather Apron. Leather Apron was the name that was given to a man that the local prostitutes spoke about uh, and uh, claimed that he would try to extort money from them with threats of, uh, of violence and, and also had a knife. Desperate to find him, if only to eliminate him as a suspect, the police began door-to-door -door inquiries around the common lodging houses of the neighbourhood. But then their investigation suffered an unexpected setback when either local gossip or the unguarded comments of their officers brought news of their suspicions to the attention of the press. On the 5th of September, the Star newspaper ran an article that would terrify the local residents. That article proved frustrating to the police, who had hoped to keep their suspicions a closely guarded secret, lest they alerted their suspect to the fact that they were looking for him. Leather Apron, the only name linked with the Whitechapel murders, the strange character who prowls about after midnight, universal fear among women, slippered feet and a sharp leather knife. The Star newspaper really built up Leather Apron into a, a demon kind of character and, uh, and described uh, the most graphic description of this, this person. The police, it appears, knew who Leather Apron was all along. They thought it was uh, a man called John Pizer. The press campaign to alert the public to the menace of Leather Apron had two results. Firstly, it alerted Pizer to the fact that the police were trying to trace him. Secondly, he suddenly found himself public enemy number one, and the prospect of falling victim to a baying mob so terrified him that he promptly disappeared and went into hiding amongst his relatives. And so the police operation was greatly frustrated. The police reacted by adopting an arm's length approach to journalists who, stung by this evident lack of trust, began grubbing around for any morsels of information that they could find. They shadowed detectives in the hope of discovering the identities of their witnesses. They attempted to loosen the tongues of police constables with drink or bribes. Some even resorted to an almost comical approach to the news gathering, hoping to gain a sensational scoop for their newspapers. One particular case which is, is interesting, there was a, a journalist who dressed up as a woman and was walking around the East End hoping that, that he might be approached by Jack the Ripper. But um, so many policemen were out in disguise that, that a bobby on the beat went up to him and said, here, are you one of us? And, uh, and he explained that he was a journalist out there and was promptly taken to the police station and detained for two hours and had to justify why he was wandering the streets dressed as a woman. The Leather Apron scare, however, had another more sinister effect on the area. The Leather Apron was the standard garment worn by a wide range of Jewish tradesmen and egged on by lurid press speculation, signs of racial unrest began to surface in the neighborhood. On the 7th of September, a journalist on the East London Advertiser sat down to pen his article for the next morning's edition. Referring to the murder of Mary Nichols, he wrote, The murderer must creep out from somewhere. He must patrol the streets in search of his victims. Doubtless he is out night by night, and unless a watch of the strictest order be kept, the murder of Thursday will certainly be followed by a fall. 
And in the early hours of that same morning, after the journalist had written his chilling prediction, but before the newspaper had actually hit the streets, the Whitechapel murderer struck again. Elizabeth Long saw Annie Chapman at 5.30 in the morning outside number 27 Hanbury Street. Mrs. Long, who knew Annie by sight because they often stayed in the same common lodging house, told the police that Annie was not on her own. She was in the company of a man, a man Mrs. Long described as dark and swarthy, a foreigner. <laughs> A little before 6 a.m. on the 8th of September, 1888, John Davis, an elderly resident at number 29 Hanbury Street, came downstairs, walked along the narrow passageway, and opened the back door. The sight that he saw shook him to his bones. Moments later, two workmen walking along Hanbury Street were suddenly startled when the door of number 29 burst open and a wild-eyed old man stumbled into the street. Then he cried, come here. Nervously, they followed him down the passageway, and looking into the backyard, they saw the body of Annie Chapman lying between the steps and the fence. Annie Chapman's throat was cut in two places, sort of two uh, sections of cutting. She'd been ripped up to the breastbone. The small intestines were taken out of the body and placed over her right shoulder, and then two smaller flaps from the lower abdomen were placed over her left shoulder. And there, in the corner of the yard, lay a freshly washed leather apron. The three previous murders had certainly caused disquiet in Whitechapel. But with the death of Annie Chapman, something happened. That disquiet gave way to panic and hysteria, as mobs began to turn their anger on anyone whom they thought might be responsible. The fact that a washed leather apron had been found so close to Annie's body led to anti-Semitism, and innocent Jews were threatened and abused by angry crowds. It soon transpired that the leather apron found at the scene of the murder belonged to one of the residents of number 29 Hanbury Street and was not in any way connected to the murder or the murderer. This knowledge, however, did little to quell the racial unrest. As one newspaper reported, a touch would fire the whole district in the mood in which it is in now. It was a widely held belief in the area that the authorities cared little for the fates of those who lived hereabouts. The inadequacy of local policing had long been a bone of contention, and the fact that the Home Office point-blank refused to sanction a reward for information that might lead to the killer's identity rankled with the local residents. The foreman of the jurors at the inquest into Annie Chapman's death even went so far as to express the view that the murders of both Chapman and Nichols might easily have been prevented had the government offered a reward in the wake of Martha Tabram's killing. The government itself did not offer a reward. The, uh, the, the the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary uh, were against offering rewards. This had been a, a policy that had been introduced by an earlier Home Secretary, so they were merely following a, a standard practice. Anxious to assist the police investigation, several local residents began their own private endeavours and formed vigilance committees in the hope of bringing the killer to justice. The vigilance committees are an important part of the Jack the Ripper case. They did have certain beats and they had their own patrols. Um, but the most important of all of the vigilance committees was that run by the president, George Lusk. And there, the sort of mile end um, committee formed on the 10th of September, 1888. Now, that was very organized. These were, although a lot of the members were unemployed, a lot of them were, were local people, local men. They were organized, but they not only patrolled the streets on beats, as I said, with a police whistle, a stick, and galoshes on the regular beats. They also did lots of other things, like physically writing to people to try and get things changed. They wrote to the government, to the Queen, to the Home Office. So they weren't just sort of groups of mobs on the streets. On the 10th of September, Sergeant William Thick went round to number 22 Mulberry Street and arrested John Pizer. There is little doubt that the police were convinced that Pizer was the man known as Leather Apron. And so as Sergeant Thick escorted him into Lehman Street Police Station, feeling must have been running high that the Whitechapel murderer had been caught. But under interrogation, 
Pfizer was able to provide cast iron alibis for the nights of the two most recent murders and the police quickly ruled him out as a suspect. He even appeared at Annie Chapman's inquest where he was given the opportunity to publicly clear his name. It was at that inquest that Dr. George Baxter Phillips, the police surgeon who had examined Annie Chapman's body as it lay in the backyard of number 29 Hanbury Street, raised the chilling possibility. The fact that her killer had removed her womb, he stated, suggested that the reason for her murder may well have been to obtain that particular part of her anatomy. Furthermore, the speed with which he did it and the skill displayed hinted that he may well have possessed some anatomical knowledge. The question of medical knowledge or surgical, surgical skill, there, there's, there's, uh, we have to make the distinction between anatomical knowledge, meaning knowing where, to, where the organs are and, and, and where to find them, and surgical skill, which is the ability to actually extract them. Um, is the, the question is, is difficult to answer. Some of the doctors at the time thought that he had both. Um, some thought that he had the anatomical knowledge, the kind of knowledge that, that a horse slaughterer or a butcher or, or somebody like that would have had, uh, but not necessarily a surgical skill. Another doctor said that it would have taken him, in those circumstances, a lot longer to have uh, committed the mutilations, and so therefore there was surgical skill exhibited. Other people said no surgical skills, no anatomical knowledge, just did what he did, and it, it was lucky that he found whatever it was that he, he found. With the police apparently unable to catch the murderer, rumours began to circulate about his identity and motives. Was he a butcher, a slaughterman, a doctor, a medical student, or even a sailor on one of the ships in the nearby port of London? Was he seeking revenge for some imagined or real injury he had suffered at the hands of a prostitute? Was he a member of some heathen sect carrying out a barbaric ritual? Was he simply seeking notoriety? Or was he on a moral crusade to clear the streets of Whitechapel of the sin of prostitution. I wouldn't have thought that Jack the Ripple was necessarily targeting prostitutes at all. Um, he may have been, we, we have no idea, but we don't know who Jack the Ripple was, so we, we have no real idea of what his motives would have been. Uh, and you, it's really a case of paying your money and taking your choice, but I think it's more likely that he was interested specifically in targeting women and was uh, just trying to destroy women. Many who lived in the neighbourhood were convinced that they at least knew his occupation. There was a rumour going around Whitechapel that he might have been a slaughterman, for the simple reason that there were many slaughterhouses in Whitechapel that were active in the early hours of the morning. Meat was being killed, fresh, for there was no refrigeration. So it would be killed in the early hours and put in the butchers at 6 a.m. And let's face it, slaughtermen wore large leather aprons that would be heavily stained with blood. What a perfect disguise for Jack the Ripple. Maybe he was even one of those himself. Let's face it, dressed like that, he could wander the streets of Whitechapel like he was invisible. The police themselves were rapidly coming round to the view that the murderer was probably a lunatic and that he possibly possessed surgical knowledge. To that end, several medical students who had recently spent time in asylums were traced and interviewed. But as with so many avenues of inquiry, this one also led to a dead end, and one by one, the students were exonerated of any involvement in the crimes. The beleaguered police officers were now coming under increased criticism from the press and public alike for their inability to catch the killer. But was that criticism justified? The police investigation, generally speaking, was handled as well as it could be. It's difficult to know what else they could have done. They basically just did everything that they possibly could, but there were no clues. And this was, the, this was a point that uh, Sir Robert Anderson made in a memo to uh, the Home Office. And he said, you know, that 
for one murder to, to occur with, with the murderer leaving no clue was, was, was uh, remarkable, but for a number of murders to have taken place with the murderer leaving no clue was absolutely extraordinary. On the 24th of September, George Bernard Shaw wrote to the Star newspaper and offered his own intriguing theory for the killer's motives. Sir, will you allow me to make a comment on the success of the Whitechapel murderer in calling attention for a moment to the social question? Private enterprise has succeeded where socialism failed. Whilst we conventional social democrats were wasting our time on education, agitation and organization, some independent genius has taken the matter in hand and by simply murdering and disemboweling four women, converted the proprietary press to an net sort of communism. No doubt Shaw's tongue was very firmly in his cheek when he suggested that the murderer was a social reformer, but there is little doubt that the Whitechapel murders had succeeded in drawing attention to the dreadful living conditions in the area. Several of the improvements that took place over the next few years can indeed be attributed to the increased awareness that the killings had focused on the neighborhood. Although Abilene and his colleagues were convinced that they were dealing with a lone assassin, their investigation was hampered by the very nature of the crimes and by the fact that his victims were all prostitutes. He struck in the dead of night in out-of-the-way places. As far as can be ascertained, there was no motive aside from the grim satisfaction of mutilating his victims. He was able to prevent those victims from crying out and thus alerting attention to their plight. He left no clues behind him, nor was there an accomplice to inform upon him. And the fact that his victims were prostitutes meant they would take him to the very places where they knew that they were safe from interruption. As one police officer put it, it's not as if he has to wait for his chance. They make that chance for him. At one o'clock in the morning on the 30th of September, Louis Deemschutz turned his pony and cart into Duffield Yard off Burner Street. As he did so, his pony suddenly shied up in alarm and pulled away to the left. Something had disturbed it. Looking down, Deemschutz could just about discern a dark shape lying on the ground by the wall. Jumping from his cart, he struck a match to get a better view. It was very windy, and the match was extinguished almost immediately. But in the brief second's flickering light, he saw the bundle was, in fact, the prone form of a woman. He had discovered the body of Elizabeth Stride, Jack the Ripper's third victim. Elizabeth Stride, also known as Long Liz in the area, was some historians call her Lucky Liz because she only had her throat cut. There was no anatomical mutilation, so it was only her throat cut. And this led the police to surmise that he'd been interrupted as he went about his bloody business. Is it possible that as he commenced the mutilations on Elizabeth Stride, the pony and cart turned into the yard and disturbed him? Did he jump back into the shadows? And was it that sudden movement that caused the pony to shy up and pull away to the left? And then crucially, in the days that followed the murder, a witness came forward who may well have seen Elizabeth Stride in the act of being murdered. Israel Schwartz turned into Burner Street and he was walking just a short way behind uh, another man. And up ahead was a woman standing in the gateway of a socialist club. And he saw this man approach the woman. They exchanged words. Then there was uh, an altercation. He was violent with the woman, he threw her to the ground. Israel Schwartz crossed the road and, and walked on, trying to get away from what he thought was a, a piece of domestic violence going on. He subsequently identified the body of Elizabeth Stride. Now, the probability is that, that the man that he had followed up the street was the person who killed Elizabeth Stride. So he probably saw the murderer. As the body of Elizabeth Stride was being discovered, a prostitute by the name of Catherine Eddowes, who had earlier been arrested for drunkenness, was being released from Bishopsgate Police Station. As she left the building, she turned to a police officer and spoke her last recorded words. Good night, old cock, she called, and went off into the night. A little after 1.30 a.m., three Jewish gentlemen, Joseph Lewenda, Joseph Levy and Harry Harris, left the Imperial Club on Duke's Place in the City of London. 
they noticed a man and a woman standing on a nearby corner. I don't like going home by myself when I see those characters about, Levy observed to Harris. Loenda, meanwhile, was walking slightly apart from the others, and being closer to the couple, observed a little more. He was later emphatic that the woman he had seen was Catherine Eddowes. The man, he said, was aged about 30. His height was between 5 foot 7 and 5 foot 8. He had a fair complexion and a fair moustache. He was of medium build and had the appearance of a sailor. But since the couple seemed to be just chatting quietly and there was nothing otherwise noteworthy about them, the three men continued on their way. Uh, it's entirely possible that Joseph Lavender did see the Ripper, um, but he only got a very brief glance at the, at the man and uh, it wasn't even totally certain that, uh, that the man he saw was talking to Catherine Eddowes. At 1.45 in the morning, PC Watkins of the city police walked his beat here into Mitre Square. The only noise he heard was the sound of his own footsteps. He'd walked this way 15 minutes previous and found the square to be quite deserted. Little now seemed to have changed as he shone his lantern into the square's dark recesses. But when the beam fell upon the spot in the square's south corner, it illuminated a horrific sight. The mutilated body of Catherine Eddowes. The injuries that Catherine sustained were really horrific in Mitre Square. She had her throat cut from left to right, right back to the spinal column. The murderer then ripped her up to the breastbone, disemboweled her, took away her kidney. He then placed her intestines over the shoulder. But not only that, to her body he actually disem well, disemboweled her, of course, which happened to most of the victims. But it was her facial injuries which were sort of really notorious because he cut off the section of her nose, he partially severed her ear, he slashed her face continuously and then also had V-shaped triangular flaps underneath her eyes, just there. In Mitre Square, the murderer had crossed the boundary and struck in the city of London, the financial square mile. And this meant that another police force now became officially involved in the investigation. The Ripper crimes were, were investigated chiefly by, by two forces. And that's the City of London Police, which is responsible for the square mile, the business heart and, uh, of, of the capital. And then the Metropolitan Police, which is referred to as Scotland Yard generally, is the, but, but is the Metropolitan Police which has responsibility for, for the rest of London. Although the previous murders had actually taken place on Metropolitan Police territory, the city police were already active in the hunt to find the killer. Major Henry Smith, the acting city police commissioner, had given instructions that extra plainclothes detectives were to patrol the city's eastern fringes where it bordered with the East End of London. And at the exact moment when Catherine Eddowes was being murdered in Mitre Square, three city detectives were searching passageways just a few streets away. And yet the killer had succeeded in striking right under their noses and had then melted away into the night. But in fairness to the police of both forces, the murderer was greatly aided by the layout of the area. In early September, Inspector Henry Moore of the Metropolitan Police's H Division had given an interview to an American journalist and had explained how the murderer's apparently miraculous escapes from the scenes of his crimes were in fact greatly assisted by the Warren-like complexity of the Whitechapel streets and alleyways. My men formed a circle around the spot where one of the murderers took place, guarding. They thought every entrance and approach, and within a few minutes they found 50 people inside the lines. They had come in through two passageways which my men could not find, and then these people never locked their doors, and the murderer has only to lift the latch at the nearest house and walk out through it and out the back way. But with the trail from Mitre Square apparently still fresh, the city police set off in pursuit of the killer. And this night, we know exactly which direction he went in, because on this night, the Whitechapel murderer left behind a clue. At 2.55 in the morning, PC Alfred Long turned into Goulston Street, and in a doorway of Wentworth dwellings, he found a clue. A piece of blood-stained apron. It had been taken from Catherine Eddowes' body. The murderer had used it to wipe the blood from his hands and from the blade of his knife. It is a clue because it answers a vital question concerning the killer's appearance as he fled the scenes of his crimes. 
The common thought is that the Ripper would have gone from the crimes covered in blood, but in fact it's possible that he probably wasn't covered in blood at all. He's, he certainly, once he had sliced the victim's throat, we know from the rather repellent blood splashes and splatterings that were all over the place that uh, the blood would have, would have emptied from the victim and once the heart stops beating then the amount of blood that, that is going to spurt out when you start uh, doing the mutilation would have been uh, relatively small so he would have had blood on his hands and, and possibly on, on some part of his clothing whether it would have shown up in the dark uh, and, and he could have used gloves may have worn an overcoat which he either took off before committing the crimes or which was open and which he could have buttoned up afterwards. Indeed, the apron tells us just how much blood he did have upon his person. For as he made his way through the streets, he was wiping away the evidence. And by the time he reached the doorway, his hands and knife were evidently clear of any incriminating stains, and thus he was able to discard the apron. But the doorway contained something else. For scrawled in chalk on its wall was a message which read, the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. But the doorway contained something else. For scrawled in chalk on its wall was a message which read, the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Jewes was spelt J-U-W-E-S, which has been the cause of endless speculation uh, in the conspiracy theories uh, about Jack the Ripper. But whether or not the murderer actually chalked those, those, those words on the wall is completely unknown. The, there are some statements that say that they look blurred as if they had been there for a while. Um, other statements say that had they been there for any length of time, they would have been rubbed off by people going in and out of the building. Soon, the city police had also arrived on the scene and instructions were given to photograph the graffiti. The Metropolitan Police, however, were becoming uneasy. The anti-Semitic unrest that had followed Annie Chapman's murder was still fresh in their minds and they genuinely feared the consequences that might result when the East End awoke to news of two further murders. As dawn began to break, the Metropolitan Police became anxious to erase the message. A city policeman suggested that only the top line, the Jews are, be erased. But this was Metropolitan Police territory, and when Sir Charles Warren arrived on the scene, he was in no mood for compromise. At 5.30 a.m., in what would prove a highly controversial move, he ordered that the writing be rubbed out before any photograph of it could be taken. He elected to have the words rubbed out, chiefly because he didn't think that there was any way that they would be able to mask those words from uh, the, the general public who would soon be thronging that area for the, for the famous Petticoat Lane market. And so, uh, he fe felt that the reference to the Jews, the Jew A's, would be uh, in sight, anti-Jewish uh, reaction in the streets, and he wanted to avoid that, so he had the words erased. With the break of day on the 30th of September, the Whitechapel murderer had succeeded in killing two women right under the noses of two police forces, and had left their senior officers baffled, bickering, and totally frustrated. Nothing was more apparent than their utter defeat and humiliation. News of the double murder crackled through the metropolis like wildfire. Thousands of sightseers flocked into the area and blocked the approach to Mitre Square. Berners Street, meanwhile, was said to have been like a sea of heads from end to end. Those who had houses or businesses that overlooked the murder sites openly charged admission for ghoulish spectators to gaze down upon the crime scenes. You had lots and lots of people coming in from, from elsewhere, other parts of London, even coming along from the provinces, and there are press reports about, uh, about lots of coaches and carriages arriving and bringing people uh, to, to look at the streets. There were lots of vendors and street 
uh, street vendors and hawkers out on the streets selling everything from cheap cereal books and pamphlets through to, uh, to fruit and any other kind of, uh, of comestible uh, to, to service the crowds of the people that were gathering at, at the murder sites and other, other places. Uh, it, there was almost a kind of carnival atmosphere going on at times in, uh, in Whitechapel as a result of the, of the murders. Press criticism of the police increased. The Star went so far as to accuse the entire force of being rotten to the core. The Daily Telegraph, meanwhile, attacked the notorious and shameful shortcomings of the detective department, whilst the East London Advertiser lamented that there was no detective force in the proper sense of the word in London at all. On the 2nd of October, at a demonstration by the unemployed in Hyde Park, a huge banner expressed the feelings of many Londoners. It read simply, The Whitechapel Murders. Where are the police? The police were in fact rigorously pursuing their investigations, albeit they had adopted a policy of guarded secrecy to prevent their lines of inquiry from becoming public knowledge. One of Sir Charles Warren's first actions in the days that followed the double event was to order extra police into the district. Detectives went about in disguise, some it is rumoured even dressed up as prostitutes. Door-to-door -door inquiries were carried out around the common lodging houses and over 2,000 residents were questioned. 80,000 handbills were distributed around the streets asking that any suspicious person be reported to the police. 76 butchers and slaughterhouses were visited and the characters of their employees ascertained. Even sailors from the nearby docks were investigated. Yet despite this thoroughness, the killer continued to remain at large. I don't know that the police could have done much more. It's, they didn't have any kind of technology that we have today. Their forensic science was in its infancy. There was nothing really they could do. The, all they were in a position to do was to just wait and hope to catch the murderer, hope that there would be some clue that would reveal the killer or hope that somebody um, who they thought must have had suspicions about a relative or somebody uh, would actually turn that person over to the police. In most cases, then as now, most crimes are committed by somebody that is known to the victim. The murder victim is usually killed by somebody they know. When it's a random killing and they don't know uh, the, the, the killer, there is nothing to connect the killer with the victim and consequently unless some sort of clue is left or there are witnesses, but even if there are witnesses you've still got to catch the guy before you can confront him with the witness. So what they were looking for were, were clues that would lead to the killer and he didn't leave any. So the only thing that they could really do was to flood the area with police and just hope that the next time he killed somebody there would be policemen around who would be able to catch him, which, but, but that didn't ever happen, and so the Ripper got away. Although October would pass with no further murders, historically speaking, the days that followed the double event saw one of the most important developments of the entire saga, because it was during this period that the Whitechapel murderer was given a name. In the wake of the double murder, Sir Charles Warren gave permission for a letter to be released which on the 27th of September had been sent to the Central News Agency. Written in red ink and addressed to the boss, it boasted in mocking terms. Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talked about being on the right track. That joke about Mother gave me real fits. I am down on halls, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can I catch her now? Chillingly, the letter was signed, Jack the Ripper. The police obviously thought the Dear Boss letter did come from the murderer because they reproduced it on huge bill posters and plastered those all around London, so they obviously thought it was genuine. A lot of people actually today, historians-wise, believe what the later police officials believe, that it was actually written by an enterprising journalist. 
The Dear Boss letter almost certainly wasn't from Jack the Ripper. It's highly unlikely that, uh, that the murderer involved himself in the Ripper investigation or injected himself into the Ripper investigation in that way at all. The release of the Jack the Ripper letters proved to be a disastrous mistake. The resultant publicity did nothing to unmask the killer, nor for that matter, the letter's author. What it did do, however, was inspire imitations, and the police found themselves swamped by a wave of bogus Jack the Ripper correspondence. All this had to be read, assessed, and wherever possible, followed up. Thus, the resources and time of the already overstretched detectives was wasted. One of the most misreported initiatives of the Metropolitan Police that of using bloodhounds originated around this time. The idea had originally been given to Sir Charles Warren by the Home Office. Warren was not overly convinced that bloodhounds would be of any use and queried how a dog could be expected to track the killer without a piece of his clothing or a trace of his blood on streets where people have been walking all night long. His reservations notwithstanding, trials were held in two London parks and Warren appears to have found the results encouraging. Indeed, so impressed was he that he gave instructions that in the event of another murder, the body must not be touched until bloodhounds could be brought and put on the scent. On the 6th of October, Robert Anderson returned from leave and took overall charge of the police investigation. From that point on, he, like Swanson, became familiar with every facet of the case. On the 13th of October, the police began a massive search of some of the area's worst slums. For almost a week, officers entered every room of every house. They searched under the beds and looked inside the cupboards. They scrutinized every knife they could find and interviewed hundreds of landlords and their lodgers. But the killer evaded detection and letters purporting to come from him continued to frustrate the police investigation. Of all the correspondence sent in the wake of the original Jack the Ripper missive, one letter has been the subject of intense debate ever since. On the 16th of October, Mr. George Lusk, president of the Mile End Vigilance Committee, received a small cardboard box in the evening mail. He opened it and there inside was a letter written in red ink and addressed from hell. Wrapped inside it was half a human kidney. The letter read... Sir. I send ye half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for ye. Tell a piece I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send ye the bloody nif that took it out, if ye only wait and wait longer. Sign, catch me when ye can, Mr. Lusk. Convinced it was a practical joke, Mr. Lusk placed the box and the kidney in a drawer. But it played on his mind and a few days later he showed it to the other members of the Vigilance Committee. They decided to take the kidney to a local medic and it was handed over to the city police in whose jurisdiction Catherine Eddowes had been murdered. To this day there is considerable debate as to whether or not this letter did come from the murderer. The evidence just simply isn't sufficient. We have statements by Major Smith, who was the acting assistant commissioner of, of the, uh, the city police at the time, who presented the kidney to the leading kidney expert of the day, Gowan Sutton, and believed that it was from Eddowes. But generally speaking, the, uh, the evidence would suggest that it wasn't. The amount of, of factual information that we, we've got there is, is not sufficient to draw any hard and fast conclusions, although the general opinion is that it wasn't. Over a hundred years have now passed since the so-called Autumn of Terror and easily as many suspects have been put forward as likely perpetrators of the crimes. Some are just downright ridiculous.
Others seem highly possible, but lack the elusive grail of cast iron proof. Today, as many books have shown, it is possible to put just about anybody into the frame and then build a plausible sounding case against them. The truth is that if we're to stand any chance of solving the mystery, we must put the crimes back into the context of the age and the streets in which they occurred. Then, and only then, do you stand any chance of solving what is without doubt the world's greatest who done it. And one of the first problems to face the budding ripperologist is exactly how many of the Whitechapel murders were at the hands of Jack the Ripper. Officially, there were only five Jack the Ripper victims, although there were two other murders that happened before that of Polly Nichols, which most history books considered the first Jack the Ripper murder, um, the murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith in April 1888 and that of Martha Tabram or Turner in August 1888 are considered by some people to have been the early sort of works of Jack the Ripper. So officially there's only five, but there may have been two others before that. And there were a couple of copycats later on in 1889, and sort of later, um, Alice Mackenzie and Francis Coles. The early crimes, the pre-canonical five murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tabram, are sometimes included in with the, with the Ripper murders, and, and sometimes they're excluded. Emma Elizabeth Smith almost certainly wasn't. She appears to have been the victim of a, of a street gang and uh, why she was, she was murdered um, or, or violated so badly that she died from, from the injuries uh, isn't known, but she, was, uh, she, she is unlikely to have been a ripper victim. But it is the fate of these five women that we will concentrate on in our story. Mary Nichols, murdered on August 31st, 1888. Annie Chapman, on the 8th of September, 1888. Then we come to the night of the double murder, the 30th of September. Elizabeth Stride was murdered in Berners Street and Catherine Eddowes in Mitre Square. And finally, on the 9th of November, 1888, Mary Jeanette Kelly was murdered in Dorset Street, Spitalfields. At around 3.40 a.m. on August 31st, 1888, a carter named Charles Cross was walking along Bucks Row here in Whitechapel, when in a gateway that used to stand here, he saw what he took to be a bundle lying on the ground. Thinking it was a tarpaulin that might prove useful, he went over to inspect it, but stopped in his tracks when he saw it was a woman lying there. Moments later, he heard footsteps behind him, and turning, saw another carter, Robert Paul, approaching. Nervously, the two men approached the silent form and stooped down over the body. Charles Cross felt the woman's hands. They were quite cold. Robert Paul, meanwhile, was leaning over, trying to see if he could detect any sign of breath. He couldn't. But when he touched the chest, he fancied it moved slightly. I think she's breathing, he told his companion, but very little if she is. Paul wanted to sit the woman up, but Charles Cross didn't want to touch the body any further. So they thought they'd wasted enough time at the scene, so they pulled her skirts down to cover her decency and went on their way, agreeing to tell the first policeman they met of their find. But what neither man had noticed in the darkness was that the woman's throat had been cut so savagely that her head had almost been severed from her body. That discovery was made by PC John Neal as he walked his beat along Bucks Row shortly after Cross and Paul had left the scene. It was he who raised the alarm and sent for local medic Dr. Llewellyn, who having carried out a cursory examination of the body, gave orders for its removal to the mortuary. Here, the night held a further shock, for when Inspector Sprattling arrived to take down a description of the deceased, he discovered something that had so far eluded everyone. Beneath her bloodstained clothing, a deep gash ran along her abdomen. She had been disemboweled. Jack the Ripper's reign of terror had begun. The woman's name was Mary, or Polly, Ann Nichols, a 43-year-old prostitute who had earlier been ejected from a nearby lodging house because she didn't have the fourpence to pay for a bed. I'll soon get my DOS money, she had confidently predicted. See what a jolly bonnet I've got. That bonnet now lay trampled in a Whitechapel gutter.
Polly had her throat cut from left to right, right back to the spinal column. Um, she had several incisions on her body. She was ripped up to the breastbone, but no organs were removed that we know of from Polly. A little before 6 a.m. on the 8th of September, 1888, John Davis, an elderly resident at number 29 Hanbury Street, came downstairs, walked along the narrow passageway and opened the back door. The sight that he saw shook him to his bones. Moments later, two workmen walking along Hanbury Street were suddenly startled when the door of number 29 burst open and a wild-eyed old man stumbled into the street. Men, he cried, come here. Nervously, they followed him down the passageway and looking into the backyard, they saw the body of Annie Chapman lying between the steps and the fence. Annie Chapman's throat was cut in two places, sort of two uh, sections of cutting. She'd been ripped up to the breastbone. The small intestines were taken out of the body and placed over her right shoulder. And then two smaller flaps from the lower abdomen were placed over her left shoulder. At one o'clock in the morning on the 30th of September, Louis Deemschutz turned his pony and cart into Duffield Yard off Burner Street. As he did so, his pony suddenly shied up in alarm and pulled away to the left. Something had disturbed it. Looking down, Deemschutz could just about discern a dark shape lying on the ground by the wall. Jumping from his cart, he struck a match to get a better view. It was very windy and the match was extinguished almost immediately. But in the brief seconds flickering light, he saw the bundle was in fact the prone form of a woman. He had discovered the body of Elizabeth Stride, Jack the Ripper's third victim. Elizabeth Stride, also known as Long Liz in the area, was some historians call her Lucky Liz because she only had her throat cut. There was no anatomical mutilation, so it's only her throat cut. And this led the police to surmise that he'd been interrupted as he went about his bloody business. Is it possible that as he commenced the mutilations on Elizabeth Stride, the pony and cart turned into the yard and disturbed him? Did he jump back into the shadows? And was it that sudden movement that caused the pony to shy up and pull away to the left? And then crucially, in the days that followed the murder, a witness came forward who may well have seen Elizabeth Stride in the act of being murdered. Israel Schwartz turned into Burner Street and he was walking just a short way behind uh, another man. And up ahead was a woman standing in the gateway of a socialist club. And he saw this man approach the woman. They exchanged words. Then there was uh, an altercation. He was violent with the woman, he threw her to the ground. Israel Schwartz crossed the road and, and walked on, trying to get away from what he thought was a, a piece of domestic violence going on. He subsequently identified the body of Elizabeth Stride. Now, the probability is that, that the man that he had followed up the street was the person who killed Elizabeth Stride. So he probably saw the murderer. As the body of Elizabeth Stride was being discovered, a prostitute by the name of Catherine Eddowes, who had earlier been arrested for drunkenness, was being released from Bishopsgate Police Station. As she left the building, she turned to a police officer and spoke her last recorded words. Good night, old cock, she called, and went off into the night. A little after 1.30 a.m., three Jewish gentlemen, Joseph Lewenda, Joseph Levy and Harry Harris, left the Imperial Club on Duke's Place in the City of London. They noticed a man and a woman standing on a nearby corner. I don't like going home by myself when I see those characters about, Levy observed to Harris. Lewenda, meanwhile, was walking slightly apart from the others and being closer to the couple observed a little more. He was later emphatic that the woman he had seen was Catherine Eddowes. The man, he said, was aged about 30. His height was between 5 foot 7 and 5 foot 8. He had a fair complexion and a fair moustache. He was of medium build and had the appearance of a sailor. But since the couple seemed to be just chatting quietly and there was nothing otherwise noteworthy about them, the three men continued on their way. Uh, it's entirely possible that Joseph Lavender did see the Ripper, um, but he only got a very brief glance at the at the man and uh, it wasn't even 
totally certain that, uh, that, that the man he saw was talking to Catherine Eddowes. At 1.45 in the morning, PC Watkins of the city police walked his beat here into Mitre Square. The only noise he heard was the sound of his own footsteps. He'd walked this way 15 minutes previous and found the square to be quite deserted. Little now seemed to have changed as he shone his lantern into the square's dark recesses. But when the beam fell upon the spot in the square's south corner, it illuminated a horrific sight. The mutilated body of Catherine Eddowes. The injuries that Catherine sustained were really horrific in Mitre Square. She had her throat cut from left to right, right back to the spinal column. The murderer then ripped her up to the breastbone, disemboweled her, took away her kidney. He then placed her intestines over the shoulder. But not only that, to her body, he actually disem well, disemboweled her, of course, which happened to most of the victims. But it was her facial injuries which were sort of really notorious because he cut off the section of her nose, he partially severed her ear, he slashed her face continuously, and then also had V-shaped triangular flaps underneath her eyes, just there. In the early hours of the 9th of November, 25-year-old Mary Kelly was heard singing in a room at number 13 oh Miller's Court. A little before 2 a.m., a casual labourer named George Hutchinson met her on Commercial Street. She asked if he would lend her sixpence. He told her that he had no money. Observing that she'd just have to find it some other way, Mary Kelly continued along the street. A man coming from the opposite direction tapped her on the shoulder. She turned and spoke with him. They started laughing, and Mary Kelly took the man by the arm and led him back along Commercial Street, walking straight past Hutchinson. He later recalled how the man stared at him in a sinister fashion. Mary Kelly led the man along Dorset Street and into Miller's Court. Hutchinson waited outside for 45 minutes, but when nothing happened, he left the scene. Shortly before 4 a.m., two of Mary's neighbors heard a soft cry of murder, but since such cries were a common occurrence in the area, they both ignored it. At 10.45 a.m. on the 9th of November, 1888, Mary Kelly's landlord, John McCarthy, sent his assistant, Thomas Bowyer, round to number 13 Miller's Court to collect her overdue rent. Moments later, an ashened-faced Bowyer returned. Governor, he stammered, I, I knocked on the door. I could not make anyone answer. I looked through the window and saw a lot of blood. The two men hurried back to Miller's Court, where looking through the broken window, John McCarthy gazed upon an horrific sight. The bedside table was covered with what appeared to be lumps of human flesh. And there on the bed, barely recognizable as human, lay the mutilated body of Mary Kelly. Soon, Inspectors Walter Dew and Walter Beck had arrived at the scene, and by 11.30 a.m., Inspector Aberline had joined them. But amazingly, it would be another two hours before any of them entered Mary Kelly's room. There was a delay between Mary Kelly's body being discovered by, by Thomas Bowyer, who had gone there to collect the rent, and the police actually entering the room because uh, somebody mistakenly believed that uh, bloodhounds were going to be brought to the scene. And in fact, they weren't, but, but they didn't know that. And it was only when a senior officer came along and, and said that the, there were going to be no bloodhounds that the police finally forced the door and entered the room. They couldn't actually get into the room because for some reason they thought the murderer must have had the key and locked the door. So in fact, when the people actually got into the room, they actually had to knock it down with an axe. They had to use a pickaxe to get into the room. John McCarthy, Mary Kelly's landlord, was no doubt giving vent to the feelings of all who witnessed the bloody carnage inside number 13 Miller's Court, when later that day he told a reporter, the sight that we saw, I cannot drive away from my mind. It looked more like the work of a devil than the work of a man. The whole scene is more than I can describe. I hope I may never see such a sight again. Mary Kelly had her throat cut from left to right, right back to the spinal column, just like the other victims. She was stabbed, ripped up from the rectum to the breastbone, disemboweled, various organs were taken away. Um, apart from her body, her face was almost hacked beyond recognition. 
Her ears were cut off, her nose, her eyebrows, her lips. Complete disfigurement of the corpse took place in Miller's court. At noon on Monday the 19th of November, the bell at St. Leonard's Church in Shoreditch began to toll a morning knell as a coffin of elm and oak was carried out of the gates in front of a crowd some several thousand strong. Men and women alike could barely control their emotions as the funeral procession set off for St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Leighton. It was with great difficulty that the police forced a path for the cortege as onlookers jostled to touch the coffin and read its simple brass plate, Marie Jeanette Kelly, died 9th of November, 1888, aged 25 years. Over a hundred years have now passed since the so-called Autumn of Terror and easily as many suspects have been put forward as likely perpetrators of the crimes. Some are just downright ridiculous. Others seem highly possible but lack the elusive grail of cast iron proof. Today, as many books have shown, it is possible to put just about anybody into the frame and then build a plausible sounding case against them. The truth is that if we're to stand any chance of solving the mystery, we must put the crimes back into the context of the age and the streets in which they occurred. Then, and only then, do you stand any chance of solving what is without doubt the world's greatest whodunit. And one of the first problems to face the budding ripperologist is exactly how many of the Whitechapel murders were at the hands of Jack the Ripper. Officially, there were only five Jack the Ripper victims, although there were two other murders that happened before that of Polly Nichols, which most history books considered the first Jack the Ripper murder. Um, the murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith in April 1888 and that of Martha Tabram or Turner in August 1888 are considered by some people to have been the early sort of works of Jack the Ripper. So officially there's only five, but there may have been two others before that. And there were a couple of copycats later on in 1889, and sort of later, um, Alice Mackenzie and Francis Coles. In the century and more since the murders occurred, the Victorian police have been subjected to a constant barrage of criticism owing to their apparent inability to catch the killer. This is largely undeserved. They were, after all, hampered by a lack of modern investigative techniques. DNA profiling, forensic science, even fingerprinting were not established forms of police procedure. And can we, in all honesty, say that modern methods would have fared any better against a lone murderer who is not known to his victims and who leaves no clues behind? Indeed. It can be argued that, given the resources available to them, Inspector Aberline and his fellow detectives did a first-rate job. And let us not forget that if, as seems likely, Mary Kelly was Jack the Ripper's final victim, then something most certainly happened to the killer when he left behind the bloody carnage at Miller's Court. The fact is, the murder stopped for a reason. And the only reason can have been that something happened to the murderer to stop him killing. Was he caught? Did he die? Was he incarcerated in a lunatic asylum? Murderers like this don't give up. Murderers like this continue unless they are caught. A number of senior officers um, are on record as having said that or, or having favoured certain suspects as being Jack the Ripper. Most famously there is Sir Robert Anderson and Donald Sutherland Swanson. In 1910, Sir Robert Anderson, as he had then become, wrote his memoirs entitled The Lighter Side of My Official Life. And in those memoirs, he states the following. Undiscovered murders are rare in London, and the Jack the Ripper crimes do not fall into this category. 
I am almost tempted to disclose the identity of the murderer, but no public benefit would result from such a course. In saying that he was a Polish Jew, I am merely stating a definitely ascertained fact. I will merely add that the only person who ever had a good view of the murderer unhesitatingly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him, but he refused to testify. So not only does Anderson say that the police caught Jack the Ripper, he also claims that there was a witness who had seen the face of the murderer. But who was that witness? Well, it can only have been one of two people, either Israel Schwartz, who saw the man attack Elizabeth Stride, or Joseph Luenda, who saw Catherine Eddowes talking with the man outside Mitre Square. I would personally say that it was Israel Schwartz because Anderson also said that this man was the only person to have got a good view of the murderer. And Lavenda only had a passing, took a passing look at the, uh, at the man that he saw and, and really didn't pay very much attention at all and, and consistently said afterwards that he would not be in a position to identify the man if, if confronted with him. Sir Robert Anderson presented a copy of his memoirs to his old colleague and fellow Ripper investigator, Donald Sutherland Swanson. In the 1980s, Swanson's grandson gave that copy to the Daily Telegraph. Penciled notes that Swanson had scribbled into the margin of the book certainly made for interesting reading and brought modern-day Ripper investigators considerably closer to identifying Anderson's suspect. And he says the suspect was called Kosminski. Doesn't give us a Christian name, but uh, insofar as research thus far has been able to, to reveal, there is only one Kosminski that, that could fit the bill because we're told that this Kosminski was committed to an asylum and the only Kosminski found in the asylum records, which was found by Martin Fido, uh, is a man called Aaron or Aaron Kosminski. Swanson also says that the reason the witness would not give evidence was because the suspect was also a Jew and the witness's evidence would be the means of the murderer being hanged, which he did not want on his mind. If we believe the marginalia, then he was, there, were, there was some reason why the police suspected him. Uh, he was taken with difficulty to a place called the Seaside Home to be identified, and that was probably the convalescent police Seaside Home in, in Brighton, where he was positively identified. The police then, for reasons which uh, baffle everybody, uh, released him. Now the probability is, is that they didn't have grounds for holding on to him any, any longer. The Habeas Corpus Act uh, means that you have to bring charges within a given period of time or you have to release the individual. If they were not prepared to bring charges because our witness apparently refused to testify or to give evidence, uh, the police would have had to have released him. He then was returned to his brother's house in the heart of Whitechapel and his family almost immediately appeared to have had him committed uh, to the, into the asylum. In early 1891, Aaron Kosminski was officially found to be of unsound mind and on the 7th of February he was committed to the County Lunatic Asylum at Colney Hatch in North London. In 1988, researchers began combing the records for that elusive piece of information that might prove Kosminski's guilt once and for all. That search brought two investigators to the door of Zena Shine, who was born in the East End of London in 1925, and whose great uncle, Aaron Kosminski, was indeed committed to Colney Hatch Asylum. It was astonishing. Two two men knocked at the door, and they said that there's somebody living here who knew the Kosminski family. They said that it was um, a centenary or something and that the case had remained open. And they said, do you have a relation called Kosminski? And I said, it was my grandfather. They said, did I know the rest of the family? I said, I, I think he had a brother. And they told me about this brother, Aaron, Aaron. They said that we think he died in Coney Hatch. Coney Hatch, you know. You know, things began to come back. All these little stories. All the family used to talk about Coney Hatch. It was a major disgrace, the brother. 
after a little while, I began to understand a bit of Yiddish, and I could understand what they were talking about a bit here and there. They used just sort of, you know, Aaron. It was, you know, it was sort of very deprecating, and they didn't. There was never any lengthy discussion. It was always just a reference, but there was never any connection. It didn't mean anything to me. I couldn't understand the significance of anything. And when I told my brother, he was so appalled, he didn't even think it was funny, he was appalled. He said, if that's your claim to fame, forget it. Who wants to be connected to somebody, you know? I mean, really? And so we find ourselves today in the position of probably knowing more about the major suspect than the majority of the detectives at the time knew. Yet that final piece of the jigsaw eludes us. If we could only uncover the evidence on which Anderson and Swanson based their suspicions, it might be possible for us to complete the puzzle and solve the mystery of Jack the Ripper once and for all. Unfortunately, many of the papers relating to the Jack the Ripper investigation have either been destroyed or else have disappeared from the official files. And without them, it is impossible to establish the guilt of one particular suspect above all others. I haven't the remotest idea who, who, he, who Jack the Ripper was. I, I, I would put Kosminski at the top of the totem pole, as it were, uh, simply because Anderson and Swanson were the two most senior officers investigating the Ripper case and it's reasonable to assume that they would have known the evidence against every major suspect. And if they thought that Kosminski, the evidence against Kosminski was better than the evidence against any of the others, Kosminski would be the, the probable leading contender for the, for the mantle of being Jack the Ripper. One thing, however, is certain. The legend of Jack the Ripper refuses to die, and interest in him increases with every year that passes. And with so many dedicated researchers still on his trail, the day may yet come when Jack the Ripper is finally brought to book. Until then, he will remain much what he has been for over a hundred years, an elusive nightmare that haunts our imaginations, where he is able to instill feelings of fear and fascination in equal measure. But his story also provides a window through which we can gaze back onto a bygone age when a lone figure stalking the streets of London really did succeed in shaking the British establishment to its very core.